Hi there folks, welcome in to this three piece, three videos for me to react to and give my opinions and perspectives on in this one here today. First one up here, Jerome Powell, talking about the state of the economy, talking about his views on everything that's going on out there, want to hear what he has to say, looking forward to obviously getting into that one and uh, sharing my opinions and perspectives on that one. Then we got a couple Tesla videos to react to. One is from obviously Big Bolt Gene Munster on his views on those Tesla earnings. He shared these views just a few hours ago on CNBC and then we're going to listen to the other bull uh, that goes on CNBC quite a bit, Dan Ives, on his view of Tesla's earnings, a conference call, everything like that, he just shared his views about an hour ago. So I want to react to that, give my opinions and perspectives in regards to that one. So appreciate everybody being here as always. Thank you so much, folks. Thank you for being subscribed to the channel. Also, thank you everybody that's joining me over on Twitch. I got a live stream on there in about an hour. Can't wait to get on there. Uh, man, yesterday's live stream was insane. We got a busy one today as well. And uh, yeah, I do those Monday through Thursday, if you didn't know. Pin comment down there if you want to join me on there if you're interested in that already guys let's get I mean, into this a lot to talk about a lot to discuss let me start with something you just referred to which is the surprise to the upside in the economic data despite as you termed it i think historically fast pace of growth are you surprised at how resilient the united states economy is just today we got jobless claims numbers surprised because they were low we got the retail sales numbers you mentioned we got industrial production across the board it seems like a very strong economy despite all you've done to try to slow it down yes so uh we certainly have a very uh, uh resilient economy on our hands we've got uh, the economy growing strongly if you think back a year many forecasts called for the u.s economy economy to be in recession this year not only has that not happened, growth is now running for this year above its longer run trend. So that's been a surprise, driven largely by uh, consumer spending, driven by a very strong job market with uh, people getting jobs with high, first high nominal wages, and then as inflation has come down, real wages, which is spurring spending. And we've also had inflation coming down. So, you know, uh, that's, it, it really is a story of much stronger demand. There may also be, there may be some ways in which the economy is um, less affected by interest rates. Uh, it's hard to know precisely, but for example, companies, many companies, any company with bond market access will have termed out its debt, right? And therefore may not be feeling the effects of higher rates. The same may be true of homeowners who have a, a long-term fixed rate, low rate mortgage, who then are therefore not because it's not an adjustable rate or a higher rate, they're not, they're not feeling that increase in rates. So the, the economy may be somewhat less uh, susceptible to the effects of rate increases. On the other hand, if you look at... Um, Before he goes further here, yeah, you know what I like to call this? I call this what has been going on this time period for the last 18 months. We've basically kind of been in a, like a rolling recession, right? Um, where essentially you're seeing like industry by industry, like in, in different sectors, different spaces, kind of go through a recessionary period, right? We watched the goods sector definitely go through a uh, what was seen as a, a pretty tough uh, recession there for a bit, right? And it seems like the goods sector is now getting out of that recession. Now we see clearly, like, it looks like housing's in a massive recession. It looks like autos are beginning to get into a definitely a recessionary environment. Furniture sales, things like that are entering kind of like a recessionary period for anything high ticket. Those are bought on loans, right? A lot of people take out debt for those sorts of things. And so it's just been kind of like rolling along where it wasn't like everything dropped at once. It's just kind of rolling along. On the flip side, travel continues to be hot. Uh, restaurants continue to be hot. Things like that. Experiences, those continue to uh, be in a very, very, very healthy place. Look at interest-sensitive spending. These are very much the the the, um, the places where we see we, where we expect to see and do see effects. So, for example, in um, in housing or in you know in the housing sector has been sector has been very affected by higher rates as yep. purchases of, of uh, durable goods. If you look at surveys, people will not say that it's a good time to buy a car or a house. Quite the contrary. So we see policy working through its usual channels. It may just be that rates haven't been high enough for long enough. And, and again, it's all happening in a context of, of very strong demand. We've heard other people speculate, maybe the terming out of debt, as you say, both corporate debt and household debt. And that debt. hurts, you know, certain people really bad, right? Um, so it's not like no one's affected by that. If you talk about a lot less homes are sold, guess what? If you're a real estate agent, gosh, you're in a tough situation for the, really this past, you know, many months, if not a year, right? And you're going to probably be in a, even a tougher situation over this next six months. If you work as a used car, uh, maybe not used car sales, well, used car sales maybe as well. But especially if you work at a, a dealership that sells new vehicles, 
you're going to be negatively hit by this, right? If you own a dealership, you're going to be negatively hit by this. So, we, you know, we don't want to act like it's not affecting people. Mortgage bankers uh, or brokers are very affected by everything that's going on for this past year, year and a half. May diminish the effectiveness of rate hikes. Do you have a view on whether that's true? And if it is true, what does it say about monetary policy? Does it mean you have to go farther in the rate hikes or do you just not have the power to affect it? So, no, I, I, I don't think that, that there's a, um, a fundamental shift in the way that interest rates affect the economy. There may be some differences in this cycle because of what I mentioned. Um, I, as I mentioned, you, we are seeing those, the effects where we expect to see them, which is interest-sensitive spending and also asset prices to some extent, uh, and the exchange rate, which you're also seeing a uh, strong exchange rate, which is, which is disinflationary. So I don't think there's a, a fundamental change in the way monetary policy affects the economy. And again, it goes back to just very strong demand. We take the economy as it is. We take fiscal policy and the economy and all the things we don't control, they come to us and we conduct policy always to achieve maximum employment and stable prices. So we just t we take what comes. The fact that we have a strong growing economy, a strong growing labor market and uh, you know, in inflation coming down. These are the elements that we want to, to see that to achieve the, the outcome we want. It may take more time, but ultimately, uh, those are, that's, this is the kind of thing you would want to see along the path to getting through this without a big increase in unemployment. How much? Boom. Exactly. Exactly. That's a point I've been making, you know, especially recently to a lot of folks, uh, because a lot of people are like, oh, the economy is staying too strong. This is making, this is a Fed's worst nightmare. No, Fed's worst nightmare is inflation is not anywhere close to 2% number, and then you have a recession, right? So imagine earlier this year, let's say we went into a big recession, huge job losses came, and let's say it was earlier in the year when CPI was still like in the fives. It was a disaster. Because then the Fed has to start cutting rates, right? Because we know we're going to do whatever it takes to keep people employed, right? And keep jobs out there. So the Fed would have to start cutting rates like crazy. When you got CPI in the fives, when they need to get it down the twos, that would have been a disaster, man. And so... If anything, you need to kill down inflation before you worry about, um, you know, uh, like potentially cutting rates. Let's just put it like that, right? Um, otherwise, you're in a real pickle if you haven't slayed the dragon yet, and then you got an unemployment to worry about. Ooh, that's a mess. Thus far, has the Fed had? Uh, we, we all have memorized now long and variable lags. How long and how variable? And where are you in that process? Are you at the 25% point, the 50% in terms of seeing it in the effect in the real economy? So there's, there's no precision in, the, uh, in, in our understanding of, of how long lags are. Um, one thing that has changed in the modern era is that markets now, uh, over the course of... Before I forget, i got to make a point there. The historical standard tells us Fed lags take one to three years to kick in, okay? So you could say this is year one. Right, 2023, because they started raising in 2022. So this was the first year. The second year is 2024. Uh, the the third year, obviously 2025. So it's likely in 2024 or 2025, the Fed lags really catch up with us, start to hit us hard, and the Fed's put in a position where they have to start cutting rates. 30 years, central banks have decided instead of being secretive. You want to know my prediction? My prediction is in 2024. Uh, the Fed will be in a position where uh, the Fed lags are catching up with us and they have to make a move. That's my Very thought. transparent. And what that has meant is that markets move actually well in anticipation, well before our policy moves. So the transmission from policy moves to, to financial conditions actually happens before the moves now, whereas that was not the case 50 years ago when Milton Friedman you know, coined the phrase long and variable lags. So, but now you have financial conditions changing and the question is how does it affect the economy? The standard channels are uh, asset prices, interest sensitive spending and the exchange rate, for example. And we, again, we do see that happening just not as fast as we would like. And I would attribute some of that to just stronger demand. You know, household savings were, were turned out to be higher. Household spending has been stronger and that's by far the largest part of the economy. Interesting, yeah, hundred percent. The consumer's going to keep going out there and spending. It's hard to get a, uh, you know, 
uh, let's call it a uh, major recession when the consumer is going out there and spending, spending, right? Alrighty, next up, two Tesla videos to get into. Gene Munster, and then we'll get into the Dan Ives one on their their takes on Tesla earnings. Obviously, Tesla stock getting hammered. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get into this. The EV maker missed on both revenue and earnings for the first time since 2019. The stock was flat following the release, but took a turn lower during the earnings call. Oh, CEO Elon Musk struck a pessimistic tone, saying he's moving through the current environment with a degree of caution. Joining us now with more, Gene Munster, Deepwater Asset Management, managing partner. Gene, good morning. You know, I was just looking at, at the beginning of the third quarter. Uh, the estimate for the third quarter for Tesla was, I think, at 84 cents uh, in earnings. The estimate got whittled down to 73, comes in at 66. A lot of focus on the automotive margins once you exclude those, uh, those vehicle credits uh, for uh, zero emission vehicles. So where does that leave us here in terms of the earnings power, how much more they're going to have to deal with in terms of price cuts and, and margin pressure, and how does it feed into the whole story? Well, margins are the critical point, Mike, and ultimately they need to improve those margins. Musk was clear, don't expect margins to move higher over the pecs in the next year as they start to ramp Cybertruck. And so this is really the battleground. This is the center vortex of the whole Tesla story. It's about margins. Margins go up. That means that this is a tech company. Margins go down. It's a typical car company. And so that's why there's so much weight on that all-important automotive gross margin X credits. And I would just uh, frame in one other detail there. It was 16.3% in the September quarter. It was 29% a year and a half ago. These margins are now approaching traditional automakers. Now, granted, traditional automakers lose a ton of money when it comes to their electric initiatives, but they are approaching those lower margins. And so, Mike, what does this mean? It means patience is a virtue. Did you hear about the guy that uh, predicted uh, earnings per share was going to miss, revenue was going to miss, and, and gross margins were going to miss? Oh, that was me. That was me. Oh. Now, when do I think Tesla's margins will start to improve again? I don't know if I've answered this question yet. I personally believe that Tesla margins will start to improve in the second half of 2024. And I believe that's when Cybertruck will go from, let's call it, being a, uh, something that's potentially hurting Tesla's margins to actually start being very accretive. I think Cybertruck's going to be incredibly profitable once they get through the big rant period. So you're looking at the next couple quarters, uh, you know, next two to three quarters of, obviously, they're going to ramp Cybertruck. It's going to be, there's already a lot of problems, but there's going to be a lot of problems uh, and continue to be, you know, issues you have to work through when you go through a ramp, especially if you have a new, fundamentally different vehicle uh, than what you've ever produced before. So there's going to be issues. It's going to be uh, something that hits margins in a negative way. And obviously, Tesla's likely going to keep prices lower here for at least the next quarter, if not a couple quarters. Uh, given the current environment we're in. And what I think is going to be really fascinating, in my personal opinion, is I think in the second half of 2024, we're going to look at a Tesla whose margins start to improve and are going up and up and up. And you're actually going to see traditional auto, in my personal opinion, margins starting to collapse. That's going to be really, really intriguing, okay? So, I don't know. We all, we'll see how it all plays out, but that's just what I foresee next year. Elon talked about this being a challenging period. He used that phrase twice on the, in his prepared remarks. He did not talk about challenges in the June quarter. And what essentially the setup here is that investors who believe that this is a tech company, I'm one of those, uh, have to wait an extra year plus to before we start to see some of those margins improve. There was another layer of uh, disappointment on the call, too, is Tesla has been steadfast with this 50% compound growth expectation. And uh, Elon started to back off with some of that language, saying that it's just impossible to continue to grow at those rates. And so when we think about Tesla and the, the story for the next uh, five to 10 years, that 20 million vehicle number in 2030 just got a lot harder uh, after his commentary last night. And so that's the near term. It is disappointing. I am optimistic. Yeah, I, I, I've always thought the 20 million number is crazy, uh, in my personal opinion, right? Elon's thrown it out there, uh, you know, 2030, 2032. I've always viewed Tesla, we're going to 10 million. That's my personal belief. I believe we're going to 10 million vehicles a year. Um, 
you know, and when I was predicting we're going to 10 million units a year, I mean, that was definitely thought of as crazy because this is back when Tesla was producing like a few hundred thousand vehicles a year when I was making that prediction. But that's truly where I believe Tesla's going. And everything I see in the numbers tells me Tesla's going to 10, 10 million vehicles likely at the end of this decade, some point in time, probably between that 2030 and 20, 20, 2032 time, we should be at about 10 million vehicles a year. For longer term reasons, but it was not a pretty quarter. Right. And, you know, you mentioned that the, the margin profile has been trending toward uh, traditional automotive companies. It's not there, but it's getting in that direction. As well as, you know, Elon uh, Musk complains about high interest rates. So they're having to cut price to create demand, whereas before it was all about supply constraints and unlimited demand. In other words, the story that got Tesla to an $800 billion market cap is, is not really there anymore, at least right in front of us, and it trades at 70 times earnings. So it's, it's, a, it's obviously a great operator with all these advantages, vertical uh, integration and everything else, uh, and, and certainly massive first mover advantage in EVs, but what do you pay for it? Well, ultimately, I think you probably pay five or six times revenue, and uh, the question is, what is the revenue going to be in the next two, three, four years? And this is, I think, where uh, people need to uh, look in the mirror and ask the, the question, which is, ultimately, where is the world going when it comes to transportation? If, it is, if the answer is maybe it's an electric world over the next 10 to 20 years, then Tesla's not going to get there. It won't get the bid that, uh, to keep the stock going. If the answer is that, they, that the world is going in that direction, I think the company is in a great position. And the reason why is that this addressable market, this is, gets back to your question about what do you pay for this? The addressable market for automotives is massive. If you take the low end, it's just over $2 trillion a year. The high end, it's $2.5 trillion. The smartphone market's about $600 billion a year. So this is 4x the size of that. Tesla's got a pole position. General Motors just announced that they're backing off some of their plans to do an all for their light truck uh, production facility. Uh, they basically postponed that by about a year and a quarter. Uh, the other automotive makers just are backing off on EVs. And so mm -hmm. I think this is the period of uh, where, diff where great companies have difficulties. And ultimately, I think that they will come out. I think you pay five or six times uh, revenue. That's a hardware software model that Apple has. Mm -hmm. And uh, where does that get you to? They'll do 100, uh, call it 25 million billion in revenue next year. That probably goes to 500 billion over the next several years, and you can kind of fill in the, the multiple there. Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, if I was to talk to Elon Musk and I was to tell him, hey, dude, make this move in 24, uh, what I would tell him to do is uh, full self driving, $99 a month. Full self driving, $99 a month. I think, you know, it, it's going to be straight margin accretive, $99 a month. And you know how many people are going to sign up for that, that own Teslas and that are going to buy Teslas for $99 a month. It's going to be a ridiculously uh, large number, right? But rather than trying to sell these upfront plans, $99 a month, you'll get the masses that own Teslas to go ahead and sign up for that, right? And guess what? You're going to get way more data if, you're, if people are using the full self-driving a lot because they signed up for it, right? Like, I'm not going to pay $12,000 for the full self-driving for my vehicles. If Tesla gave me an option for $99 a month, 100%. I would do it right now. I'd do it right now, literally. Um, but if it's not $99 a month, I'm like, eh, yeah, I don't really need it that bad. So, and I just think that's probably the view of a lot of people out there. And I mean a lot of people. $99 a month, you got us. But, you know, trying to sell these twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 full self-driving packages... It's just you're going to get a very small amount of people to uh, go ahead and do that. So, and man, you know, once again, if they were to do that $99 a month and you got mass to sign up and you also you got millions of vehicles, you know, that are essentially, uh, you know, on this $99 a month plan, like think about what that does for margins overnight, like absolutely incredible. Already, let's hear Dan Ives and his opinion of the conference call and what's going on here with the good old Tesla Maesla. Dan Ives, Webbush Securities Analyst, does cut his target to 310. He was at 350, but keeps the outperform rating. Dan, it's great to have you. Yeah, great Thanks to be for here. coming in. What about it? What made you say that? I mean, if you looked up disaster in the dictionary, there'd be a video of last night's conference call. And I think the problem is, is that the street wanted to get details. Have the price cuts ended? Where is the gross margin outlook? What is the man ultimately look into 2024? And instead, it was really must put on his macroeconomist sort of hat. And that's not what the street wanted. I think it was lack of details. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it was a somber note 
for, especially when it looks at Cybertruck and you look at the margin outlook, and I think the long-term thesis is still there, but with no rose-colored glasses, I mean, this was definitely what I'd call a, a disaster. Would you expect anything different from a guy who runs a company who's good? So, folks, okay, that is a huge comment coming from Dan Ives, because Dan Ives has always come across to me as a, you know, a little bit of a pumper. Let's call him that, okay? Uh, a little bit of a pumper, always looking at things from the positive angle. Blah, blah, blah. And so for him to say that definitely smells like, oh, you know, it's a big comment. Obviously, that's a very similar word choice I used on the live stream uh, yesterday on Twitch, right, uh, in terms of the conference call. So, uh, but I call it how it is. Dan Ives, I, I, I don't, you know, I've never really looked at him as somebody that really, like, calls it how it is, in my personal opinion. So, um, yeah, interesting that he would even make that comment. Are 90% financed, right? I mean, that's that's the automobile. Yeah. Now, look, there's no doubt that that's something that's helped them and now hurts them. But, but Carl, I think the big issue is really around the price cuts. Because as you've seen the price cuts, there was a view that it would start to end by, the, by this point. And ultimately, by having the door open and also by losing your CFO, that was, I think, a huge part of the credibility. Investors came off that call. And I can tell you, institutionally speaking... Just a lot more questions, no answers. And I think that's really the frustration. And that's why you're seeing the stock under almost extra pressure because of that head-scratcher conference call last night. Dan, you're one of the biggest bulls on the street. You come here all the time and have talked up Tesla Ooh. for years. Correctly so in many ways. By the way, I'm glad you're here on a bad day too. But what did you get wrong here? I think what we got wrong in the short term was the price cuts were going to end. And there was, you knew the, the poker move of the price cuts this year has paid off Massively, and I think that's really sure from a demand perspective. But that, that really, ninety-five percent of the price cuts I believe are done. I thought Musk would have put the line in the sand, maybe a few more price cuts, then we're over. Instead, by leaving a the few door more price open, cuts? I think the communication is maybe what we underestimate, even from Musk, by not putting a line in the sand. That Dan Ives, what are you talking about, Dan Ives? Wait a minute, Dan Ives. This is why I, uh, he's all over the flip and flapjack in place. Did you hear what I I hope everybody just, you know, if you've been in the market a long time, you just picked up on everything this man just said. Okay. He had a $350 price target on it, right? And then he's talking about, oh, I was hoping to hear must say, you know, uh, only a few more price cuts. A few more price cuts? Dude, what do you think margins are going to go to if he does a few more price cuts? You've got to expect, if anything, Musk is done doing the price cuts. And the executive team's like, that's it for price cuts. We're keeping pricing stable from here. If you're expecting a few a few more price cuts and you have a $350 target on the stock, you're crazy. 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 Like, come on, man. What are we talking about here? That's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. <laughs> Jeez, sometimes some of these Tesla bulls make about as much sense as the Tesla bears, and that's sad. Frustration here, because now it's a Pandora's box, and you can't put the genie back in the box. But well, how can he put a line in the sand on price cuts when we see the 10-year yield and the 30-year yield move up every single day to new highs? And if that's really what's driving it, how can you know? Yeah, and it's a great question. I think it's really about the price cuts in China. And if you look what's happened there, even BYD and some others have started to soften some of the price cuts. And I think you, by, by continuing to cut prices, especially in China, that price war, they're actually making worse. And I think that's been the biggest thing because you're talking about 40, 50 percent of overall demands coming out of China. We believe the long term story is intact. The sum of the parts thesis, full self-driving, AI, what they're going to invest in. But no doubt in the near term. And because yeah, Tesla needs to quit the price war in China. They're never going to win that. They will never win the price war in China, ever. They will and are winning the price war in the United States. They will win the price war in Europe. And so Musk and the team need to not look at the Chinese market the same they look at the U.S. market. In China... You know, folks definitely look at, at Tesla as like a, a premium quality vehicle. Um, if they put it in the same regard that they would like, you know, Audi or Mercedes or BMW or those sorts of brands. And so if there's a market you could maybe take a little more price in because, you know, people view it in that way. I think you need to take it in, in, in China when you're, you know you're never going to win on price. BYD is selling vehicles for $20,000. You're not going to sell the Model 3 for $20,000. 
or the Model Y for that matter. And so don't worry about the price war. Let, let the, the lowest end players play in the lowest end, focus on just being that premium brand, and there's gonna be plenty of people that wanna buy Teslas in China, okay? Um, but you're not gonna win the price war there. You will win the price war in the United States and in Europe, okay? Those are very different markets. Tesla needs to have a very different strategy for China than they do the United States and Europe. And hopefully the executive team's you know, starting to realize that more and more. Conference call, you know, I think you're definitely gonna see uncertainty. It's almost an albatross right now that, that, that's around that Where stock. is the operating yeah. margin? 7.6%, I think, came in. How does that? That's like closer to other automakers, right? Well, yeah, because I mean, they they were in a massive position of strength, come down toward other automakers, and now it comes down to, you know, does this start to stabilize, increase from here? Obviously, software. You could argue FSD is going to be a big piece going forward. Look, we've been here before. We've seen it in 17 and 18. We've been through some of these white knuckle periods with Musk, but but I would put last night as a top three. Probably worst conference call I've heard from Elon, you know, in the last few years. Yeah, no doubt. I 100% agree with that. Um, but, in t- you know, to, to wrap up in regards to Tesla, right? I think it's important everybody remembers, like, Tesla's long-term, like, somebody that's been investing in the stock for years, like myself, everything is perfectly going as well as it could for the long term. Uh, but short term, obviously, there's a lot of headwinds. There's going to continue to be headwinds, obviously, the next several quarters. I think we can start to have some things start to work for us and you're going to start to see a lot of improvements in my personal opinion in the back half of 2024 and uh, that's going to be an exciting period obviously but for the short term here there's not a lot of momentum there and obviously a lot of short-term traders don't want no piece of the stock right now which i completely understand appreciate everybody joining me as always thank you so much for being here folks thank you for being subscribed to the channel new all-time high subscribers in the history of the channel also if you want to join me on twitch i'm going live on there and shoot less than an hour so that will be pinned comment down there to join me on twitch much love and have a great day